Welcome back to the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel, and this week I'm being more clever and not saying what day it is in the intro, so I don't mess it up if it comes out later. And on that subject, I just wanted to put a reminder out there that there isn't a team here at Fulcrum Entertainment, it's just me and my good friend Gilbert. So, for these videos, I record all the audio, I make the video, I upload the video, I make thumbnails, I make the descriptions. There's no one else working on audiobooks that I read other than me. The audio comics like Batman the Killing Joke and uh, TMNT The Last Ronin are all Gilbert's work. Gilbert also does all the work for the podcast and the live stream that we do every week. We don't really get paid. YouTube has given us about 200 bucks in eight months, certainly not enough to live on, and so we have real jobs. And all that means that the things that come out here on the channel are things we do for the love of it, and also things we do when we have time. That means that unlike perhaps a business-based YouTube channel, our release schedule might not always be consistent, and also we're just going to do the things that we want to do rather than necessarily trying to chase views or try and get more engagement. And I mention this because sometimes there are folks in the comments who I think are really enthusiastic about what we're doing on the channel, but they're acting a bit more like we're being paid, like this is our job, like we need to get everything out. And I'm afraid the practical side of it is we won't be able to do things perfectly all the time. And the other side is, if this feels like a job and I'm being shouted out by customers, it's not going to be something I want to do anymore. So I'd appreciate if, while we're having our cool conversations in the comments, that we could just keep in mind this isn't a business, we're just doing it for the love of it. And sometimes comments like, when is this going to happen? I want you to do this specific book. And even one comment that told me I shouldn't read a book because I would ruin it if I did. Those comments can be more stressful and more negative than I think the people mean them to come across. Good thing is, though, this doesn't apply to the vast majority of the Fulcrum Knights leaving comments out there. So let's go over and say hello to some of them. Like Googe, who said, I like the fact an HK droid was used in the novel. It would have been so sweet if one of the last three movies had thrown in an HK. I do hope the canon is changed if an HK is used in Star Wars in the future. Or even one of Lando's Terminator-style Von Killers. Interesting, I don't know those. What are they? And the Ion Sith, who is doing something that I always love to hear people doing, says, I love your reading. I got this book from my local library and have been following along just like I did with Death Troopers. Can't wait for part three. Brilliant. Fantastic. That's the best thing ever. Thank you for doing that. Supporting libraries and supporting the author and getting in some extra reading. Fantastic. About time I did some reading as well. So let's jump into chapter 10, Strapping on Ghosts. The impact knocked her sideways against the wall of skins, and Zoe recoiled, found her equilibrium, and brushed off the scuttling hard-shell beetles that clung to her skin before they could sink their hungry little mouthparts into her. The things fell to the deck, scuttled blindly for an instant, and then vanished beneath the cracks, as if the whippid ship were just another corpse for their investigation. Below her feet, the engines had fallen silent. In the stillness, she sensed the Miracore resigning itself to gravity, redistributing the vicissitudes of torque through its thousand tiny joists and connectors with a deep and exhausted sigh. Zoe still couldn't tell if they'd crashed or if it had just been a rough landing. She waited, scarcely breathing, as the thrusters cooled, ticking, and ultimately falling silent. From outside, she could hear the wind. The sound brought with it a kind of alien desolation that seeped in from somewhere outside the Durasteel reinforced hull. She felt the skin on her back tightening with a shiver. It felt as if they landed in some windowless crawl space in the bottom of the galaxy, a place inexplicably devoid of entrances and exits. Her gaze flicked back to the orchid, hoping for an explanation, a means of understanding what she felt. Something's gone wrong out there, she thought. Can you feel it? Across the room, the vacuum-sealed gasp caught her by surprise. The whippet was standing in the open hatchway again, clutching his spear in one hand and a bunched-up bundle of furs and hides in the other. He tossed the furs at her feet. Put those on. 
Zo didn't budge. What are we doing here? Get the plant. Are you going to answer me? He turned and stalked out again, this time leaving the hatch open behind him, an unspoken demand to follow. Was there some other component to his brusqueness besides just impatience? Was the bounty hunter as uneasy as she felt? Zo looked down at the pile of furs and pelts. They had been stitched into crude mittens, boots, a hat, and what looked like a kind of cloak. Squatting, she pulled the boots over her feet and found that despite their bulkiness, they fit well enough when she lashed them tight around her ankles. They were recent kills, she realised. She could still feel the residue of the lives that had worn them as skin. It was like strapping on restless layers of ghosts. Picking up the cloak, she slung it around her shoulders and reached up to the sealed transparent lab packet containing the orchid, slipping it free from the cable that pinned it down. The orchid seemed to shiver and flattened its petals against the wall of the chamber closest to her hand, as if drawn to the warmth. It was murmuring to itself, not out loud, but in her mind, in one of a thousand languages that she didn't understand, an obscure tongue of hums and hisses. She stepped out into a long, narrow corridor lit by irregular panels of interior lights and followed it forward through another open hatch. Here the walkway narrowed even further, the ceiling lowering until she thought she'd somehow gone the wrong way. Hunching her shoulders to negotiate a turn, Zoe realised how truly cold it was. An abrupt blast of arctic air slashed across her face and forearms, and she turned, open-mouthed and startled, tasting the first iron-flecked coldness in the back of her throat. White flakes swirled up the landing ramp, and in the sickish, pale green glow of the landing lights, she got her first look at where they'd settled. They weren't sitting on any kind of pad. It was out there. They'd missed it completely. The landscape outside the ship presented little more than a broad, snow-seething steppe of white on white. The wind brought a thin film of tears to her eyes, and so wiped them clear. In the distance, across the void, she could just make out the jagged peaks, cutting upward like a black spinal column. There was something both erratic and oddly deliberate in the outline of those mountains. An instant later, she realised what it was. They weren't mountains at all. She tried to swallow and felt no moisture in her throat. The freezing dry air had sucked it away, eliminated it entirely. In her arms, tucked against her, the orchid had started to make the same repetitive clicking sound over and over again, as if it were stuck on a thought a compulsive, stammering noise that she didn't like at all. The tip of a spear touched the back of her neck, just above the rough hem of the collar. Move, Tolk's voice said from behind her. Zoe's feet wouldn't budge. They seemed to have been riveted in place. Wait, she said, not turning around. Those black shapes out there in the distance, they're... I know what they are. Which planet is this? she asked thinly. Ziost? The spear tip slipped a little against her skin, but it didn't hurt. She was far too lost in what lay in front of them to feel the pain. We shouldn't have come, she said. There's a toxicity level that I can't account for. It's... Move. Do you have a droid you could send out to sample the atmosphere? Just to make sure. The spear tip pushed harder insisting, hurting now. Zoe started down the landing ramp. Fresh kills or not, she was immediately grateful for the boots and skins, the heavy fur pelt piled around her shoulders and around her neck. The snow wasn't deep. In many places, its crust was firm enough that they actually walked on top of it. But the wind was surgical, a precision instrument with needles for teeth and it found even the tiniest exposed places on her skin attacking them. In minutes, 
Her face was a numb mask, her cheeks heavy and lifeless. She fixed her stare on the black, crooked spine of the peaks in the horizon. They were closer now, and any initial resemblance to mountains had long since vanished. The ruins and escarpments had a crudely mechanised appearance, and the resulting sprawl looked as if the massive skeleton of some ancient machine, city-sized, planet-sized, had been half-buried here, abandoned while it was still alive enough to dig itself out. In the midst of it, like some pivot upon which it all turned, a great black tower. It rose up crookedly, a sloping monolithic pile constructed of sleek black rock, the grave marker of some long dead deity. Even from here, its height dwarfed the half-ruined complex below. A good pilot could have parked a long-range freighter atop its flat roof. Red lights swarmed and shimmered inside its upper levels, their erratic patterns flooding the cloud of snowfall in a deep arterial glow. It was like watching a digitised readout of a brain going insane and dying. The crunch of Tolk's footsteps faltered and slowed to a halt, and Zoe lowered her gaze to what lay immediately before them. Twenty metres ahead, the ground dipped, and a kind of crude gateway rose up, webbed with clots of ice. She was aware of a silence here, the wind shearing abruptly away, leaving them in a pocket of utter quiet. Zoe took a breath and held it, then finally spoke aloud the words that had been haunting her since she'd first emerged from the bounty hunter's ship. This is a Sith Academy. The whippet marched on, the unspoken silence of his confirmation hitting her even harder than she had anticipated. What planet is this? He ignored her. Why are we here? He skulked past her to the gate. Despite his size and imposing stature, there was a hesitation to his approach, as if he didn't know quite what to expect beyond this point. It's the orchid, isn't it? Tolk turned back to her, spear in hand. She saw knots of ice dangling from his hair. His eyes were lost in shadow. You were right to be afraid, she said. Whatever's inside there is worse than you can possibly imagine. I'm only trying to warn you, she went on. You know I'm a Jedi. I can feel... Something happened then. Some truncation of motion, as if time itself had been tricked, cheated out of its rightful due. Before she knew it, an icicle of pain, a single radial spike, jagged upward into the underside of her chin. And when Zoe opened her eyes, she saw Tulk standing directly in front of her, the sharp part of the spear thrust upward into her flesh, biting in, drawing blood. He had moved faster than she'd ever imagined, faster even than her enhanced powers of perception could quite register. Zoe pulled back, freeing herself. What do the Sith want with the Murakami Orchid? Tulk blinked at her once, slowly the blink of a creature that preferred to spend its time alone. You can tell me now, she said, or you can kill me, but I'm letting you know I'm not going another step without knowing what's waiting for me in there. She thought about everything she'd heard of the academies, hives of darkness so black and toxic that they blazed with their own special kind of evil, unimaginable to those who'd never witnessed it firsthand. Even those darkest of places seemed clean compared with the rancid feeling of contamination wafting out from in front of these peculiar, half-ravaged structures, their slabs and black tower overhead. But you already know the orchid can't live without me. For a long time, Tolk didn't answer. So long, in fact, that Zoe wondered if he'd planned on ignoring her entirely. A moment later, though, he spoke. Have you heard of Darth Scabrus? Zoe felt something clenching deep in her chest. It was familiar, this tightness, like an emotional echo of some long-forgotten childhood fear. 
She remembered feeling it the moment the ship landed. And now it had a name. Darth Scabrus! She felt her gaze sucked inexorably back toward the tower. He wants the plant, Tolk said. I'm bringing it to him. That's the job I was hired to do. I see. No, Tolk said. You don't. He shook his head. But you will. Zoe tried to speak, but all that came out was a croak. Tolk stared at her from the other end of the spear, the inarticulate ultimatum communicating more than words ever could. A moment later, she stepped through the gateway. So that ends chapter 10. Will chapter 11 show us more of this taken Liam Neeson ripoff with her brother going after to find her? Will he arrive on... Uh, I could, we heard the name of the world earlier, but I can't remember what it is for the life of me now. So what do you guys think is happening now? We know that this orchid seems to be involved in an experiment that Darth Scabras is doing. And since we know this is a prequel to Death Troopers, I think we can assume this is linked somehow to the virus that caused all the undead to arrive on that ship. But what do they actually need the orchid for? And what is it they're actually trying to do? Are zombies the end goal? Or are they a unhappy accident? Let's talk to some folks in the comments. We've got uh, Taco No Tequila. Says, enjoy the book, man. Let's go. Also, enjoy the stream. Getting me through my boring job. Keep up your amazing work. Thanks very much, Taco No Tequila. Thank you for joining us for the stream. They are moving to Saturdays, my friends. That's a big shout. So, we are going to be doing them Saturdays instead of Sundays. The same time, so that's 4.30 p.m. Eastern, uh, 2.30 p.m. Mountain, and 1.30 p.m. Pacific, as well as 9.30 p.m. UK. Come and hang out with me and my good friend Gilbert at the weekend. And Heike Toka 420 I wonder what he likes to do in his spare time, uh, comment, Just got back into Star Wars, and I find you entertaining to listen to while playing Old Republic. Ooh, an excellent uh, activity to do while listening to the books. And then we have Tony Vlashins, who says, Getting a Darth Bane vibe from the Sith training school. I know nothing about the Star Wars universe in this time. I'm looking forward to next week's show. Good to see you as always, Tony. Now, let's carry on with the story, and we'll get into Chapter 11, Mind Eraser, No Chaser. Roll your trays and welcome to Marvel. I'm Niall Zemmert. We were told you were coming. The silver-haired agricultural lab attendant stood with his hand extended. Trace paused just long enough to give it a perfunctory squeeze, his eyes already scanning the area, taking in everything at once as they walked across the landing bay. The ship he'd commandeered was a generic mid-sized star skiff, big enough for a crew of eight, small enough to escape scrutiny, retrofitted with ion engines and a Class I hyperdrive for long-range travel. He travelled alone. I want to see the research level. Of course, Emmett nodded. The incubation chamber is on B7. There's where your sister took care of the orchid. The lift was waiting. Ten minutes later, Emmett guided him between the rows of plants and vegetation, heading for the chamber's airlock. The panel hung open and Trace looked in at the broken electronics equipment inside, squatting down to place both hands directly on the dirty, scratched surface of the chamber floor. As well as we can tell, Emmett said, as Diesel was... Trace cut him off with a gesture, not bothering to glance up. A flurry of activity surged through him. He heard Zoe's voice and saw the face of her attacker. It was a whippid, he realised the biggest one he'd ever seen, yanking her and the orchid out of the chamber. Trace felt his sister's surprise blurring into pain as the blunt end of the whippid spear slammed her in the head. He felt the blinding impact as he jerked back, slumping unconscious to the floor, the flower tumbling from her grasp. The whippid bent down, hoisting her over his shoulder and grabbing the orchid at the same time before he turned and lumbered away. He came here for the flower, Trace said. Emmett nodded. 
Well, Kamiok, it is renowned for its force abilities. It possesses power, but it requires a keeper. Someone with an equally high midichlorian count to keep it fully alive. Was there anyone else in this part of the facility at the time? Just Wal Benis, the lab director. Is he still... Unconscious, Emmett replied, in the back to tank. Our physicians estimate he'll be awake in a day or so. We can't wait that long, Trace said. What about surveillance in the loading and landing facility? Our sensors recorded the arrival and departure of an unlicensed ship early this morning. Emmett glanced away, abashed. Must have come in under some kind of cloaking device and managed to evade our detection. But we went back to this morning's footage and found this. He reached into the pocket of his lab smock and pulled out a data pad, thumbing it awake. Trace looked at the screen. It showed a shot of the main hangar below, centering on an oblong vessel that looked as if it had been grafted together from scrap. Despite its ungainly shape, or perhaps because of it, the ship had a canting, rough-hewn meanness a crude bulk that defied anyone to get too close, for fear of whatever might have been waiting inside. There was a series of partially worn numbers and letters on the side of the hull. Can you enhance this image? Trace said. Emmert pressed another button, magnifying the picture until Trace could read the name on the side. Miro Corps. We haven't been able to fully identify the call letters yet. That's because they've been scraped off, just enough to make them illegible. It's an old smuggler's trick. Trace frowned a little. You said it got through using some kind of cloaking device. Emmett nodded. Yes, but... What's that? Trace pointed at the screen, at a series of pale bluish-green discolorations along the mirror core's port side. The marks had an oddly phosphorescent glossiness, almost as if that portion of the ship's outer plating had been streaked with a layer of iridescent oil. Garbon scoring? No, the Jedi Knight shook his head. That's Thulian vapour residue. It's a galactic anomaly, a mixture of post-industrial airborne pollution and crystal fog. You only find it in about three places outside the mid-rim. Emmert gave him a blank look. Have my ship ready, Trace said. I'm leaving in five minutes. Within the hour, he confirmed his suspicion. The nearest Thulian cloud formations in existence cast a permanent shadow over Quen, a dreary post-industrial outpost along the outermost borders of Hut space. By day's end, Trace had landed there. The Quen space station was a polluted sprawl of docking bays, warehouses and repair facilities, cantinas and unlicensed gambling parlours. Without drawing undue attention, Trace walked through a dozen different establishments, talking to the pilots, fugitives, mechanics and fringe dwellers that made up the station's population. He bought rounds of drinks, fighting his own impatience, and listened to long, seemingly pointless monologues from barflies who hadn't enjoyed such an attentive audience in years. In the end, it was a one-armed Bothan smuggler named Gree who told him what he needed to know, the former whereabouts of the Miracor's owner, a whippet bounty hunter who went by the name Tolk. Haven't seen him around in a while. Gree said, after Trace had brought him a series of drinks, including a local favourite called a Mind Eraser, and crossed his one remaining palm with a stack of credits. Word is that he picked up a pretty sweet gig. Nobody knows what. Trace met the smuggler's gaze, holding it fast, feeling the force flow through him into the Bothan's mind, completing the task that the liquor had already begun. Did he say anything about a flower? Uh, Gree's face went smooth, all reluctance draining away from his voice so that the words came out easily. Yeah, that's right. He was going after a flower. 
Tulk wasn't much of a talker, but we got liquored up one night and he started telling me about it. Who hired him? A Sith Lord named Darth Scabrus. Trace felt a sudden coldness pass through him. Located where? I don't know. A Sith Academy? Gree grimaced a little, struggling with the memory. I want to say, uh, Odacer Faustin. He blinked. Hey, you think I could get another drink? But Trace was already gone. And that's the end of short chapter 11. Quick question, what kind of booze goes into a drink called a mind eraser, do you think? And do you think it's as bad as a pangalactic gargle blaster? And let me know if you know what and where a pangalactic gargle blaster is from. Hello to Caden Power, who wanted to help me out with a couple of pronunciations and said, yeah, it's pronounced whip id rather than wife id as I had erroneously been told before. And Caden Power also says, also it's pronounced Mirocore, rather than Mirocore, as I said previously. And let's give a warm welcome to Arbiter1223, who's come back and says, It's been a while, got busy with IRL things, and the first thing I see when I come back to the Fulcrum community is the prequel to what brought me here in the first place. Could not have been better timing. Yep, you looked out there, Arbiter, uh, with a Kenobi going down. We got round to this Booker a bit faster. Booker? That's not a word. This heat wave is melting my brain, so let's read fast while we can. Chapter 12, Ingredient Stepping out of the turbo lift, Zoe felt her hope dwindling away. Escape was no longer an option, if it ever had been. The Whippet had led her through the ruins of the academy, passing a few Sith students and masters who had stared openly at them, their faces darkened with anger and determination. If the Orchid registered any of this, it said nothing. It was mid-afternoon when they reached the tower. An HK droid had met them at the entryway. It confirmed Tulk's identity with a retinal scan that left the Whippid blinking and wiping his eyes in annoyance, and escorted them through. The turbo lift had sucked them upward and dispensed them here, into this room. For a moment, Zoe could only stare at it. A laboratory like nothing she'd ever encountered in years of research sprawled out to fill the space in front of her. She could hear small things shifting and moving in the corners. It seemed, in some horrible way, to be an insidious dark analogue of the plant lab on Marfa, its instruments designed not to foster life, but to inflict and sustain dosages of pain on whatever might still be alive here. There was something rustling in a cage in the shadows, making little smacking noises with its mouth. Do you have it? With an involuntary breath of surprise, Zoe turned and looked back. In the centre of the lab, a tall man in a dark robe stood watching them, his face a chiselled amalgam of shadow and bone, the cheek structure cruelly sharp the hollows of his eyes like the sockets of a skull. Zoe felt a thin wire of fear probe downward through her chest and into the pit of her stomach, where it dangled, twitching in the darkness. She thought of the name that Tolk had mentioned on their way here. Darth Scabrus. The Sith Lord was staring at her, his expression inscrutable although the raw intensity in his stare was unmistakable. It was as if he was looking at something that he wanted simultaneously to possess and to destroy. Without a word, the Whippid took the orchid from Zoe's hand. He walked over to where the Sith Lord stood and held the flower out to him. This is it. Darth Scabrus took the flower giving it only the most cursory of glances before returning his attention to Zoe. There was a glimmer in his eyes that hadn't been there before. Tolk stood waiting. My money, he said. If the Sith Lord heard him, he showed no sign. He was still staring at Zoe. 
Her name's Estizo Trace, the Whippet said. She's the Orchid's keeper. It needs her to survive, Scabrous said. I know. That's how I knew you were bringing me the genuine article. He reached up and touched her face, his gloved hand cold against her cheek, like leather wrapped around an iron rod. It was the one piece of information that I withheld about the orchid. Then our business here is finished, Tolk said. The Sith Lord nodded. My droid will pay you on the way out. The Whippet nodded and walked away. No! Zoe called out after him, watching him go. Wait! She felt a steel band of panic tighten around her chest, pressing painfully inward, crowding out her breath. She heard his footfalls growing quieter down the long, stone corridor. Then the faint hydronic whoosh as the lift doors opened and shut again. Then he was gone. The Sith Lord was still looking at her. A new silence spread out, seeming to fill the lab with a stinging mist of cold, dry air. Zoe was aware of the orchid making anxious noises inside her mind. A soft, irregular click of nervous energy awakening to what might happen next. Although she knew she was the only one who could hear the sounds, she felt an irrational impulse to hush it. You are a Jedi, Scabrous said. I am. She braced herself for his contempt, even rage, but the Sith Lord simply nodded as if he'd been expecting nothing less than her appearance here, had in fact anticipated it. He reached out with one hand, not quite touching her, and she felt a certain heaviness underneath her left breast, as if his palm were pushing directly against the muscles of her heart. Then he lowered his hand, and the pressure disappeared. He picked up the flower and carried it away across the laboratory to the place where Zoe had heard the soft lip smacking noise. What she saw inside made her stomach do a slow, nauseated barrel roll. The teenage boy in the cage was staring up at her with bright, unblinking shoe-button eyes that bespoke nothing less than utter madness. On closer examination, Zoe saw a vine-like tangle of plastic tubes sprouting directly out from the young man's back, where they seemed to have been implanted into his spine and the base of his skull. Thick, Yellowish-red fluid crept sluggishly back and forth through the tubing. Zoe followed the lines across the floor to where they connected to an electronic pump with a large glass cylinder on top. A ghastly kind of circuit had been created here, she realised. A hybrid between human and machine. Scabrous made an adjustment to the pump. The fluid in the tubes moved faster. The boy went rigid, and then began pounding his face against the cage over and over again with a terrible kind of rhythmic intensity. The cage clanged with the crash of impact until the boy's face began to ooze blood, trickling scarlet from his nostrils and lips and the corners of his eyes. Still, the boy did not stop. He was beating himself senseless, Zoe realised, trying to knock himself unconscious, or perhaps simply to kill himself, ending whatever torment was yet to come. Stop! Zoe stared back at Scabrous. What is this? Watch and see. What are you doing to him? Scabrous didn't answer. A moment later, he opened the top of the cylinder of reddish-yellow fluid, and dropped the orchid inside. Jura Ostrogoth witnessed the whole thing. He'd slipped inside the tower when the Whippid had stepped out, not giving himself time to deliberate. Experience had taught him that such opportunities ought not to be wasted, and so he had gone. Ever since Nicta's disappearance the previous day, the Academy's rumour mill had been humming along at light speed about Darth Scabrous and what might be going on up in his lab. 
Earlier this morning, Jura had overheard Pergus Frode, a technician at the Academy's hangar, telling one of the other masters that Scabrus had had visitors, two bounty hunters, who hadn't returned to their ship last night. And now, Kindra had told Jura that she'd seen two more off-worlders, a whippid and a girl, heading into the tower. They were carrying something with them, Kindra said. Nobody knew what. It was only a matter of time until someone came out. After lightsaber training, Jura had gone off by himself and crouched down underneath the snow-encrusted stones of a half-collapsed ruin facing the tower's main entrance. The cold hadn't bothered him in the least. It had given him time to think, to clear his head. He had already decided that he wasn't going to spend his life worrying about being exposed by Skopik. If he was going to escape from underneath Skopik's thumb, he needed to change the game. Of course, he couldn't counterattack now. Having just cornered him, Skopik would be expecting retribution. But once Jura found out what was happening inside the tower, he decided, he would arrange a private meeting with the Zabrak. He would tell Skopik everything, confide in him, gain his trust. And when Skopik was off guard, gloating, Jura would... What? Kill him? Maybe. Or perhaps just humiliate him, the way that Skopik had humiliated Jura. In any case, things were about to be very different. How different, Jura could never have guessed twenty minutes earlier, as he had slipped out of the turbo lift and made his way across the open laboratory at the top of the tower. Candles and torches dotted the room with flickering, intermittent light. He'd been worried that he might have been heard. The lift was hardly silent. But even before the doors opened, he'd heard someone screaming and a metallic crashing noise. The sound bounced off the windows and stone ceiling, blocking out everything else. Jura slunk through pools of shadow, making his way between the clusters of equipment, until he could make out the unmistakable shape of Lord Scabrus and someone else. A girl, standing next to what looked like a cage animal, the source of the crashing and the screaming. Jura stopped again, narrowed his eyes, looked more closely. The caged animal was Nicta. Nicta was thrashing in his little prison, shrieking and writhing and blubbering out noises that sounded only slightly like words. There was blood running down his face, sticking and clinging to his cheeks, as if he'd been sitting under a melting red candle. He was half naked, his exposed torso gleaming with sweat. But the worst were the tubes. They ran directly out of his back, long, pipe-like conduits from his spine, leading to a machine with a large transparent cylinder mounted on top. Scabrus was doing something to the machine holding up some object that Jura couldn't identify, putting it inside the cylinder. The fluid inside it began roiling, changed colour, became, suddenly, remarkably incandescent, pulsing through the tubes into Nectar's vertebrae. The screaming stopped. Jura watched Nectar collapse to the floor of the cage, motionless and silent, Mouth half open, eyelids sagging. Now the only sound was the high, steady drone of a heart monitor in flatline. Jura let out the breath that he'd been holding in his lungs for the last ten seconds. He didn't need to get any closer to see that Wim Nicta was dead. Zoe stared at the dead Sith student in the cage. His eyes were still open. Glassy and lifeless, his mouth sagged, a bloody spit bubble clinging to the corner. A waxy pallor had already begun to spread over his cheeks, turning his skin a pale shade of grey. In her mind, the orchid was still screaming. She couldn't move, couldn't think. Nothing in her experience at the Marfa facility or before had prepared her for this. 
In the past 48 standard hours, the routines of her daily existence had become a blood-soaked travesty of reality. Her eyes flashed up to the glass cylinder where Scabrous had dropped the flower. It wasn't there anymore. The fluid seemed to have absorbed it, dissolving it in chunks. But she could still hear it. Wherever it had gone, whatever had happened to it, crying out, begging her to do something, to help it, to stop the pain. Burning so! It's burning! It's burning! Scabras was watching the cylinder. In the cage, the dead boy sat up. Oh dear, looks like we might not hear the orchid anymore, although perhaps we will if his tortured plant soul hangs around in the force much longer. This next chapter's really short, so instead of reading out comments, I'm going to give a quick ad. Hey, did you go and see Thor, Love and Thunder? Did you think, that character Gore's cool, but not in this movie enough? Or, I think he's badass, and they're not doing enough with him? Or, I've never heard of this character, what's he about? Well, my friends, please stay here on YouTube after you finish the audiobook, but search for Thor God Butcher by Russian Comic Book Geek. The Russian Comic Book Geek has made an amazing audio comic, just like we do here on the channel, of Thor God Butcher, the entire run in one single video, and I play multiple characters. So, my friends, if you're interested in that story, go check it out. It is real hardcore, real heavy metal. I'll pop a link in the description for you. Now let's read Chapter 13, Dragon Teeth. Jura never saw the door blow off the cage. It happened so quickly that the only thing his mind registered was the wire mesh flying across the lab, slamming into a vented power cell housing that protruded down from the ceiling. Metal struck metal with a flat, declarative clang that reminded him somehow of the sound of training blades clashing at the top of the temple. It was a noise that said, Things have been put into motion, and whatever happens next, there will be no going back. From his hiding place, Jura stared, crouching in the shadows as if welded to the spot. He saw Scabrous and the girl staring at the cage, neither one of them moving. The thing that crawled out of the cage wasn't Wim Nicta. It was draped in Nicta's skin, yes, and it wore some version of Nicta's face, but the eyes were ovals of smeared glass, behind which pupils darted back and forth in the torchlight, like tiny black insects trapped inside a dirty bottle. It cranked its head to the right, and the yellow grin that wrinkled its lips back was unlike anything Jura had ever seen. Watching it, he felt himself melting inside, a breathless terror invading him, stripping away strength, reducing him to a shuddering pool of nerves. The intuitive voice of the Force was shouting at him now, Wrong! 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 but he couldn't seem to move. The Sith Lord gazed upon his creation. A terrible, prescient smile crept across his face. Nicta, he said, come to me. The thing shuffled another step forward, and Scabrous held out one hand, beckoning it forth like an animal. Yes, that's right. All at once, Nicta sprang forward with an entirely different kind of urgency, the tubes ripping out of its back, flailing free, leaving a row of raw-looking open wounds down its spine. Reddish-yellow stuff splashed and spewed from the open tubes, spraying out into the air. From his hiding place, Jura saw the Sith Lord rear backward, his arms in front of his face as the thing that had once been Wim Nicta landed on top of him and without hesitation sank its teeth into Scabrous's face. Scabrous swung one arm upward and the thing flew back across the lab, its body reduced to a momentary blur, flailing into a tall rack of unused flasks and beakers not far from where Jura was still crouched. 
The rack exploded in a deafening cacophony of shattered glass, the thing tumbling over the floor, and Jura saw it push itself upright, its cheeks and forehead glittering with broken shards like dragon teeth. Astringent smells of alcohol and ammonia and carbolic acid filled the air. Jura saw the girl stand up and run for the turbo lift. She never looked back, not even as the doors sealed shut behind her. A roar of fury shook the chamber around him, loud enough that Jura felt it reverberating in the hollow of his chest. On the opposite side of the lab, Scabrous rose up. The right half of his face hung down in a pale, bloody flap. Above it, his eyes coruscated with anger so ferocious that it looked like something entirely different, something dangerously close to madness. The Sith Lord flung out his right hand, palm raised in the direction of Nicta's corpse. The corpse jerked back again, tumbling like a thing on wires, and this time Jura Ostrogoth realised that he was the one crouched directly in its path. Realisation came too late to save him. Nicta's corpse collided with him, knocking him off his feet and pounding the air out his lungs, hurling both of them backward into one of the wide, curved viewports that formed the tower's wall. Jura's final impression, that the entire world was bursting apart around him in a brittle, deafening explosion, was not altogether wrong. Then he fell. Okay, everyone, there it is. The zombie outbreak, it's finally turned up. Who had money on chapter 13? Chapter 13, who bet on chapter 13 is when the zombies would finally make an appearance. I was interested to know whether we were going to have more time um, just hanging out in the lab creating zombies or whether we'll go straight to a breakout. Now, this last scene looks like we're going into a breakout straight away. What do you guys think? We'll move on to the final chapter of the video soon, but first let's say hello to some people, like Spiffy Muscle, who says, Hearing about the Sith and Jedi in this book is giving me serious Knights of the Old Republic vibes. Also, nice listening to this while working on Star Wars Legion models. Thanks for the inspiration. Very glad to hear it, Spiffy. That is an excellent thing to hear you're doing while listening to the books. Another fantastic hobby. Jake the Donut King says, My friend Dan told me about how he got shouted out and told me about this channel. Planning on watching Death Troopers now. I hope you've enjoyed, and if you're finished, you come back here to enjoy Red Harvest. And Glenn Rowe says, I really, really enjoy listening while I drive to work. Keep up the great work. Glad to hear it, Glenn. Hope work goes well. And now, Chapter 14. Dropouts. Lusk. Rance Lusk stopped walking, paused a moment, and turned around. He had been on his way to the Academy's library for an afternoon of solitary meditation and study when the voice piped up behind him. It was Rart. The smaller, wiry-framed apprentice stood with both hands behind his back, gazing at him defiantly through the veil of falling snow. He looked radically different from the last time Lusk had seen him. Something changed in his posture, his bearing, the way he held his shoulders. Even his voice was bolder, more direct and confrontational. His eyes were polished stones, filled with a new and willful sense of determination. What do you want? You weren't at lightsaber practice this morning. Lusk didn't even bother to shrug communicating his indifference solely through the lack of expression. Everyone at the academy knew that he only attended training sessions when he felt like it, when he wanted to test himself or prove a point to one of the masters. He took a step closer to Rart. They were alone here behind the library's immense sprawl. The academy's masters and students otherwise engaged in training or the rigours of a midday study. Above them, the tower stood, its shadow banded across the walkway like a premature twilight, and it occurred to Lusk that this, too, might have been deliberate on Rart's part. Perhaps he had hoped Lord Scabrus 
might happen to be looking down. Well, what is it? Rart brought his hands out from behind his back, revealing what Lusk had already guessed would be there. A pair of training lightsabers glinting in the grey afternoon light. Does Blade Master Shockworth know that you ran off with two of his toys? Lusk asked. Rart didn't smile. The intensity of expression never wavered. I challenge you! Cocking an incredulous eyebrow, Lusk asked. Now? Now. For an instant, certainly no longer. Lusk almost considered it. Then he shook his head. You don't want to do that. What are you afraid of? From you? Lusk blinked lackadaisically. Boredom, for a start. Then I'll be sure not to bore you, Roth said, and tossed one of the blades in Lusk's direction. Lusk caught it on reflex, but lowered it to his side. I'm busy now, he said. If you're determined to humiliate yourself, you'll have to do it publicly in front of... Masters. Had been the last word of that sentence, but Lusk didn't get a chance to say it, before Rart jumped at him, his feet hardly seeming to touch the ground. As opening salvos went, it was brutal but effective a move whose grace would have been easier to admire if it hadn't ended with Rart's blade thwacking him across the chest, raising a hot streak of pain just below his collarbone. Lusk spun back, blade up, aware now that he was in this whether he wanted to be or not, and with Rart, he realised, it wouldn't be as simple as flattening him. An example would need to be made or else every student would be out here trying him. More than anything, Lusk felt a kind of exasperation. Hadn't Nicta been enough of a lesson? Was Rart suicidal, or simply insane? He dived forward with his own blade, tensed for impact, but Rart wasn't where he'd been just a second before, seeming almost to have vanished in a cloud of snow. Lusk looked up, the other apprentice was somersaulting directly over him, spiralling down, and Lusk's instincts flung him out of the way a split second before Rart landed. Your Ataru has improved, Lusk grunted. You've been practising. Pivoting hard, he brought his own blade around where he predicted Rart would be, and this time he was right. When Rart looked up, he found himself facing the tip of Lusk's blade. One stroke would finish the duel. Two would kill him. But there was another option. Now, Lusk said, meeting the other apprentice's stare and letting the force flow through him like an electric current. Drop your blade. Rart held his mouth taut until the tendon stood out in his jaw. His arm quivered, but he didn't release the blade. Drop your blade, Lusk repeated. Still, Rat didn't move. Lusk felt real anger taking hold of him, the kind of rage he rarely experienced. Without hesitation, he thrust his own blade at his opponent. If Rat was so determined to die like this, out here behind the library, then Lusk would oblige him. As he swung forward, he heard a window shatter overhead. Looking up, he saw something explode out of the top of the tower, momentarily arrayed in a glinting halo of broken glass. At first, Lusk thought it was some kind of alien species. It had too many arms and legs, and then he realised he was actually seeing two people, one wrapped around the other. The drop from the tower had to be a hundred metres or more. They fell together, twisting in mid-air, plummeting downward, slamming into the rocky, snow-covered walkway with a sickening, meaty crunch. Despite his reputation for toughness, Lusk had to look away. Gravity had made a meal of the corpses, contorting them into unfamiliar shapes. Broken bones punctured the flesh. One of them, a shirtless, blood-smeared sack of leaking viscera, 
lay at such an angle that Lusk could see its right eye protruding from the socket. Then it sat up. Lusk gaped at it, paralysed by a dozy wave of perfect awe. That's impossible, he thought. Nobody survives a fall like that. Nobody. His thought, whatever was left of it, broke off cleanly. The blood-smeared one was looking straight at him with its one good eye, a savage, inhuman smirk swimming over what remained of its face. Besides knocking the eye out, the fall had done something to its spine and shoulders, wrenched them around sideways, jamming the clavicles outward, shoving the bone of his arm up through the skin. It looked like a suit of flesh-coloured clothes that had been recklessly draped on its hanger. Yet it was still moving. Its broken arms grabbed the other corpse, scooping it up in one flopping, eager gesture and raked it towards its mouth. And that was when Lusk realised that behind the broken bones of Leia and Blood, he was looking at the mangled bodies of Wim Nicta and Jura Ostrogoth. The thing that had been Nicta bobbed its head and buried its teeth in the pulpy remains of Ostrogoth's face. Almost immediately, Lusk could hear the noises, a series of greedy, slobbering grunts. Ostrogoth, what was left of him, made no move to resist. What is that? Rod's voice was murmuring behind him. What is that thing? Lusk shook his head, stepping back. He had no idea what he'd just seen. This would all take time to process, to decide how he was going to fight it or use it to his own advantage. But for the moment, he'd take it on its own terms. You figure it out. Tossing his blade aside, Lusk turned on Rat and grabbed the smaller apprentice by the tunic with both hands, yanking him forward hard enough to snap Rat's teeth together like castanets. Rat's shock had left him vulnerable, an easy target. Rat's own blade slipped from his hand, clanking off rocks before it stuck in the new-fallen snow. Wait, what are you doing? Rat asked. You can't! Lusk spun him around and shoved him backward, as hard as possible, in the direction of the slobbering, eating thing that was crouched over Jura Ostrogoth. Rat squealed, arms pinwheeling as if something in the air could hold him up. Almost immediately, his feet tangled beneath him and he stumbled, staggered, slid, and finally fell, landing first on his knees, then on his back. The Nicta thing lifted its head. Fresh blood drizzled from its jaw, dripping off its lips. Its one functional eye shivered like a raw egg in a cup. It thrust Jura's corpse aside and devoted its full attention to Rat, with the appetite of a creature being offered live meat. No, Rat was saying, scrambling upward, or trying to. No! No! Lusk turned away, legs already tensed to run. The last thing he heard, the moment before he bolted into the library, was Rat's scream. And there's chapter 14. It's really interesting, this book, isn't it? How we've had lots of characters established and then almost immediately killed off. Like, people are being killed very fast. And it's very hard to know, when you're reading in this book, who's going to be sticking around with you till the end. It's almost got that sort of George R. R. Martin kind of vibe. But maybe not as built up as that, because obviously you have long periods with characters before they get uh, murdered. But in this, we're just, you know, hey, let's hang out. Who's this guy? We find out his motivations. Up, oh, dead. Move on to someone else. How are you guys finding the book? Are you enjoying it so far? Are you happy the zombies have finally shown up? Who's in the comments? Who can we talk to? John Boy says we need an insignia for the Fulcrum Knights. That's an interesting idea. I wonder what sort of symbol or insignia or logo we could do to show the Fulcrum Knights. And TGM is being very kind, saying this is the best way to end the week. Keep up the good work. 
Thanks very much, TGM. I appreciate your support. Shane Millen saying, really enjoying this channel. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. We will. And Ibatoy Censorship, who I just want to call out for pointing out something that I've seen this guy in the comments for ages, and I never realized that Ibatoy is just YouTube backwards. And I feel like the dumbest man in the world. But anyway, folks, that's it from me. All that's left for me to tell you is, surprise, more plugs. Y'all need to go over to Star Wars Audio Comics. Yeah, if you're not feeling some Thor, maybe you're feeling some Star Wars, because Star Wars Audio Comics just released a Lando Audio Comic, and it's one that Gilbert, our good friend here on the channel, made, was the editor for, and did some lines for, and I did some voices. I was the voice of Lobot. There's a link in the description below and maybe something on the screen here in front of you now. But whatever you do, head on over to Star Wars Audio Comics to see their latest releases. And now it's the real end, so please subscribe to the channel. Remember, hit that bell icon so you know when videos come out. And if you've enjoyed this and you want to get this uh, channel appearing more on YouTube, please leave us a like. Until next time I speak to you, remember, we are all Fulcrum.